Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our event entitled Diplomatic and Economic Potential of Iran's New President Raisi. I'm Nargis Bajokli, an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Today's event is a part of our Rethinking Iran initiative here at JHU SAIS, which we began in the spring of 2019. Now, there's been a lot of political change over the past few months in Iran and in regards to the JCPOA. And with an unknown future for the JCPOA and President Biden continuing to enforce maximum pressure sanctions on Iran, how is Iran's new government, which just came into effect um, in early August, looking at Iran's economy and its political relations? We couldn't be more than pleased to have with us today two of the utmost experts on Iran's economy and policy worlds to help us think through these questions. Uh, Esfandir Batmankadich is joining us today, who is the founder and CEO of Borsun Bazar Foundation, a think tank focused on advancing economic diplomacy, economic development, and economic justice in the Middle East and Central Asia, and particularly Iran. And he is also a visiting fellow with the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. We also have with us today Bijan Khajapur, a veteran strategy advisor for the West Asian markets, who has over 25 years of strategic consulting experience with global companies. He co-founded UN, uh, e, sorry, EU NEPA, a firm providing Iran-related strategic consulting services to European, Eurasian, and West Asian companies. Um, I've, I always learn from the both of them, and so I very much look forward to today's conversation. Now, before I turn over the floor to our speakers, I'd like to invite the audience to ask your questions throughout the event in the chat box on YouTube, and our team will be monitoring those and sending them our way, and we'll pose those questions to our speakers during the Q&A session of the program. Esfandiar and Bijan will first give brief remarks, <clears throat> excuse me, and the rest of the session will be run as a conversation between us uh, before we open it up to the audience for Q&A. Without further ado, I hand over the uh, mic and the floor to Esfandia. You're on mute, Esfandia. Thank you, Nargis. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, if you could just let me know that um, you can see everything correctly. So hopefully you can see that now. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak on this topic, and it's great to be here uh, with Bijan. Um, I think the way I'd like to approach this is uh, to go back to really the message that a lot of the candidates had during Iran's presidential election. And the economy loomed large over the election. Iran has basically experienced three years of economic contraction uh, since the Trump administration reimposed sanctions in full in November 2018. And that's had really devastating effects for um, uh, hundreds of thousands of Iranian households and uh, for the Iranian economy at large from the standpoint of its continued economic development. And candidates, when asked about uh, what their plans would be for Iran's economy uh, during the presidential elections, pointed to this idea of developing a resistance economy. And this is a concept that's been in Iranian economic thinking uh, really since sanctions uh, were first imposed in full in around 2012. Um, and the idea of the resistance economy, if we're going to try and give it an, an operational definition, is the ability of Iran's economy to generate growth while under uh, significant unilateral or multilateral sanctions. And if we take that definition, Iran's economy can resist sanctions. But what I'm gonna show you in three charts is that that resistance is limited and delicate, and this has political implications uh, that uh, we're gonna talk about in today's talk. So the first chart that we have here is Iran uh, Purchasing Managers Index data for the manufacturing sector. And we have this data running back to October, 2018. This is data collected by the Iran Chamber of Commerce. And PMI data is a measure of economic activity. When the PMI is above 50, it means that the sector is growing. When it's below 50, it's contracting. And what you can see here is that for many of the periods uh, since uh, 2018, when the secondary sanctions came back in full, Iran's manufacturing sector has been growing. And this is sort of a proxy for economic growth in the overall economy. So you can see here that in the early part of the chart, which is the months uh, 
that were leading up to the full reimposition of sanctions in November 2018, you had the economy in basically a deep recession. Then you have the first economic recovery starting, and I'm, I've just highlighted here with the green circle that the PMI always uh, goes below 50 when it's the Iranian New Year because a lot of businesses close in that period. But you have this sort of extended period when uh, a reco recovery is underway, uh, factories are producing more, there's greater demand for their products, and uh, in many cases, those products are being exported. Then you have COVID-19 and it basically interrupts that first period of recovery. And like many countries around the world, Iran's economy is thrust into a deep crisis, particularly for uh, things like the manufacturing sector. And that continues for a couple months before you start to get a second recovery from a low base. And at the end of the period, you can see that again, we've slipped back into contraction. So. Uh, there wasn't a new global pandemic in the early part of this summer, but there were um, systemic problems like blackouts affecting uh, Iran's uh, electrical grid. You had another wave of COVID-19 related to the Delta variant, and you had a weakening of Iran's currency. So when these things come together, suddenly uh, a recovery that looks robust can be interrupted. The other thing to look at when we look at Iran's economy is sort of the financial situation. And one of the ways to look at that is to uh, kind of look at the exchange rate of the US dollar and the real. And this exchange rate is a measure of economic sentiments because people tend to uh, flee Iran's currency and, and try and purchase a foreign currency when they feel that the economic situation is, is turning negative. Uh, but it's also a very important kind of functional consideration because Iranian companies need to buy hard currency in order to uh, purchase uh, imports. And this chart starts uh, at the tail end of 2018, again, when the sanctions were reimposed. And you can see here that I've highlighted an initial period of devaluation and where the currency, Iran's real, starts to lose value against the dollar. Then it begins to stabilize for a while until you get the COVID-19 crisis starting in early 2020. And that really leads to a very sharp period of devaluation as uh, supply chain disruptions, a breakdown in Iran's exports and uh, increased uh, kind of budgetary pressures all combine to create this sense of um, panic basically in the economy that contributes to the devaluation of the real. And then at the final sort of tail end of this chart, you'll see this third period of devaluation, which is just starting. And interestingly, this sort of starts right around the time Raisi's election looks certain, and it looks certain before he was elected uh, and the elections actually took place. And that is in some ways an indication that people were growing more uh, pessimistic about the economic outlook. And then finally, I think uh, it's hard to sort of summarize what's happening in, in an economy as complex as Iran's in just three charts. But the final thing I wanted to sort of touch on is uh, the geopolitical implications of resistance economy. So when we often hear that term uh, and we read news about what Iran's foreign policy looks like and, and who they're trying to trade with, one of the sort of narratives that emerges is this idea that Iran is able to resist sanctions because of its trade uh, with uh, certain partners like China, like Russia, like regional partners. And here we have a chart that shows customs data for China-Iran trade since uh, basically the beginning of 2018. So the period before the reimposition of sanctions and then the basically two years after. And what you can see here is that uh, we can say that China contributes to Iranian resistance to sanctions, but the contribution is less kind of uh, substantial and less definitive than uh, you might expect based on uh, some of the sort of news that we're reading about the China-Iran relationship. And so in the early part of the period, you can see that the blue line, which shows Chinese imports, so this is purchases that China is making from Iran, are very high uh, because of course this includes imports of Iranian oil. But by this first uh, period here, this peak, you have the, re the revocation of oil waivers that have been issued by the Trump administration to permit the purchase of Iranian oil even after the secondary sanctions had been reimposed. 
And from that point forward, China-Iran trade has been at this low level, a stable level, but a low level. And what's not illustrated here, which is significant, is that oil imports and exports were decoupled. And what I mean by that is that oil imports that China is making from Iran are no longer reflected in this customs data. And basically, China's purchasing Iranian oil, but that oil is being intermediated. It's being sold through third countries, principally Malaysia, to a lesser extent, the UAE and Oman. And so when it arrives in Chinese ports, it's often, it's basically declared as an import from those countries, even though the crude oil is Iranian. So it's not reflected here in this data. And so the true value of Chinese imports is higher than what this data shows. However, what's significant is that in the Chinese exports to Iran, which include really crucial uh, categories of goods, including machinery and, um, and uh, vehicles that are important for the operation of Iran's industry, remains low, even if that we know that the true value of imports is higher. And so there's basically a structural barrier here uh, that's preventing Iran from purchasing the uh, full volume of goods that it probably needs to give its economy the growth that we had prior to the imposition of sanctions. So again, the story here is that China is helping Iran resist uh, the sanctions pressure, but that resistance is limited. And as we uh, saw in the previous charts, because of the ability of events like COVID-19, periods of inflation, periods of uh, uh, sort of issues like blackouts, the recoveries are also delicate. So I'll sort of leave it there and turn it over to Bijan to talk a little bit about the structural challenges, but hopefully that helps illustrate um, that resistance to sanctions is possible, but it is not absolute. And, uh, and that really comes to explain why uh, the Rice administration is in a difficult position. Bijan John, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Esvan, you are great. Thank you, Nargis John, for the introduction and hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, just to uh, sort of underline some of the points, especially the key conclusion of Esvan Diar's presentation, that the Iranian economy is resistant, but it cannot potentially generate the type of growth that this economy and the country need over the next uh, let's say decade or over the, let's just focus on the Raisi uh, uh, administration over the next four to eight years. Um, first of all, why is it resistant? Many people don't realize that Iran has a very diverse economy. In fact, if you look at the contributions of the different uh, sectors to the economy, about 54% of the Iranian economy is actually based on services. These are different services. And, and obviously in service sectors, you have a lot more um, ability to react to sudden changes. And, and, uh, and the service sector was also hit, especially because of the Corona crisis. Um, the other factor is that the, the, there, there is always, a, uh, for example, when you look at the data on, uh, uh, on um, purchases in imports of uh, different uh, spare parts and raw materials and so on. The Iranian economy, because it has had, or the economic players in Iran, because they have had uh, uh, various uh, crises to deal with, even before this uh, recent phase, they always plan for a longer period than the average international company. So the stocks they have, the raw materials, spare parts are always planned for a longer period. And that allows them to maneuver if a crisis happens and, and, and if, a, um, uh, if, if basically a sudden change emerges within the economic realities, whether it's the exchange rate or whether it's the availability of certain goods and, and so on. So there are certain facts in the Iranian economy that allow it to be more resistant to, to external um, uh, shocks and, and external challenges. Uh, but there are also a number of underlying factors why this economy cannot sustain this uh, sort of low to medium growth that it has achieved in the past year. When you look at the growth figures, the Iranian economy 
declined for a couple of years after the introduction of the maximum pressure. 2018, 2019, in total, the Iranian economy declined by about 12%. But now in the past Iranian year, which ended in March, 2021, the economy grew, but by 0.7%. So very marginal growth, but at least it has come out of the decline. Why can't it, and, and by the way, the projection for this year is that the economy will grow by about 2%, 2 to 2.6%. But the point we are making is this low growth cannot be sustained without major changes. Why? One, there are some underlying structural issues. Budget deficit is one of them. And the budget, high budget deficit, which is mainly caused by, uh, by sanctions and, and, and lack of access to, to Iran's own resources, uh, that leads to uh, inflationary pressures. And, and, and that's not the only inflationary pressure. There are a lot of other inflationary pressures so that the inflation has been above uh, 35% for, for the past uh, three years. And that is obviously eating into the purchasing power uh, of the Iranian uh, society. The average family in Iran has become poorer as a result of this pressure. And this eats into the substance of, of economic activity in Iran, because uh, obviously one of the factors helping the local industry uh, to be optimistic, as, as Esfandiar explained, uh, is domestic consumption. Iran has an a population of about 80 to 85 million people. And there are a number of uh, groups from neighboring countries that also sort of uh, in a way consume, uh, can be considered consumers in Iran. So a, a huge market, but that domestic market is losing purchasing power. And the loss in purchasing power means that there will be less demand and that will have an impact. There are other, underlying factors and structural factors that will make a growth path uh, very difficult. One of them is capital flight. If you look at the capital movements in Iran, the capital account over the past eight years, just look at the eight years uh, of the Rouhani administration, and you see that there were only two years where the capital account was positive. And these two years were the two years when the uh, JCPOA was signed and then JCPOA was implemented. Ever since the collapse in a way of the JCPOA, we have had cap negative capital account in the order of five to six billion dollars a year. This is money leaving the Iranian economy. These are Iranian families migrating, Iranian families investing in uh, properties in Turkey or in Southern Europe to get residency in those countries. But essentially it takes out substance from the Iranian economy. And, and if this trend or these trends, high inflation, loss of uh, purchasing power, capital flight, and migration, if all of these trends continue, it will lead, no matter what the government does, lead to, uh, to further economic deterioration. And then we will be back in a, uh, in a negative uh, uh, cycle of, of economic growth. And by the way, talking about economic growth, because of demography, um, the Iranian economy needs a growth of about seven to 8% to address unemployment, especially youth unemployment. This is another structural issue that, that needs to be addressed. So I've mentioned all of these to now connect to the question of, okay, how can the Raisi government uh, approach this, address all of these issues? Um, and that's what connects us to the sanctions, because obviously the, the fastest path towards economic recovery is the lifting of sanctions for two reasons. One, it will allow Iran to access its own hard currency reserves. We have between 100 and probably $130 billion of Iranian funds being stranded on international accounts. Not some, most of it is, belongs to the Iranian government and the central bank. Some of it belongs to Iranian banks and enterprises. Those are also important because all of those banks and enterprises and the government as a whole are running deficits right now. And if they can access their own funds, it will allow Iran to breathe. It will allow the government to fill the budget deficit. Uh, 
it will allow some of the banks to, uh, you know, to 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 use the the added funds to um, um, reform their own uh, balance sheet structures. So we have uh, a, a sort of quick path towards potential recovery, which would be the lifting of sanctions. That's why when you listen to the Iranian uh, authorities, what they insist on to happen very fast is access to Iran's international funds. Uh, and, and that will make a difference. If, if that doesn't happen, there could be a, a, a second scenario of an interim deal, uh, an interim deal that would sort of allow step-by-step -step access of Iran to some of its funds, uh, obviously in return for some Iranian uh, actions. But that could also help, but in a, in a, in a different uh, with a different pace, if you want. And then a third scenario is obviously uh, a continuation of the status quo, in which case uh, there will, as Esfandiar explained, there will be some, some more resilience and some more potential in the economy. And the government will also probably continue to use other resources, for example, its shares in, in, in national enterprises so that it can access some other funds, but it cannot be sustained over time. So we have these, these scenarios in front of us. And I think we can know, Nargis and Esfandiar, if you agree, move to the, uh, to the question of, okay, what can be done uh, in each of these scenarios uh, and how feasible is it with, with the current political realities in Iran and also in the US? Thank you for that, Bijan Jan. Um, okay, so you both bring up really interesting points and um, I, I kind of want to pick off on what Bijan was saying at the very end, um, which is the, um, that the fastest path to economic recovery is sanctions lifting and, and coming back into the JCPOA in one form or the other. Um, but I think the question looming over the JCPOA negotiations and definitely looming over it for the more conservative factions within Iran is um, they come back into the deal or, you know, the, 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 the deal comes about, they, they talk with the United States, it, it comes back in, in formation. And then in about two years time, a Republican is elected again into the White House and they withdraw from the deal. So, you know, in this scenario in which the fastest path to re economic recovery is, a re you know, is sanctions lifting via the JCPOA, how do you then respond to those questions that folks, especially on the more conservative end in Iran are posing, which is, we come back in, the, the US withdraws again in two years. Is this just a cycle? Like, is it a two year recovery period and then everything goes south again? What happens here? Shall I, shall, or shall I go? Um, obviously there could be some measures that Iran could take to, to sort of uh, manage that risk because that risk will be there. I think, uh, uh, so, and that risk will have impacts on, on multiple levels. But one, one approach could be that they repatriate the, the hard currency uh, in a different way, you know, before the US withdrawal from the JCPOA, Iran intentionally left some of its uh, assets on international accounts. Uh, and, and we should also not forget that uh, the, the banking bottlenecks had not been resolved uh, immediately after the, uh, the, the implementation of the JCPOA. A lot of international banks were still hesitant to uh, interact with Iran. So, there, there, there are definitely some lessons that Iran has, has learned to, to reduce its vulnerability as a result of a US withdrawal. Uh, and and I, I can imagine that um, uh, a lot of the, uh, the commercial and, and trade decisions will still continue the path of uh, what we can call the, the resistance economy strategy in terms of, for example, trading with immediate neighbors where there is less um, vulnerability towards the behavior of international banks and, and, and international markets. Uh, so I think there, if they return, my, my feeling is that within the, as, as you talked about the conservative circles, within the conservative circles, uh, 
the main goal will be, um, you know, as allowing Iran to access its funds right now. That's the top priority. And then they would probably come up with some measures on how to manage this risk in the future, in case a future US administration withdraws from the deal. But I'll, I'll let Esfandiar come in. I mean, I, I very much agree with um, how Bijan has framed this. I think if the question boils down to for hardliners, is it worth re-entering the deal uh, or restoring the deal in full if there is a chance that we would have a Republican administration tear it up? I still think the answer there is a resounding yes. Um, and there are two ways to look at this. One way is what is the expected outcome? So there is a risk that a, a Republican will win uh, and uh, Biden won't get a second term or a Democrat won't have a term after Biden. And as a result, we have the JCPOA in jeopardy again. But you have to weigh that possibility against the certainty that Iran will benefit economically from the deal uh, for the you know, period until that election takes place and probably a little bit after that. And in addition to that certainty, I think you have to look at the opportunity cost of not re-entering the deal. So um, you know, if the idea of the resistance economy is that Iran's, economy, Iran's economic planners uh, give resiliency to Iranian economic operators, meaning businesses, um, uh, banks, and also to households, then it's very useful to have two to three years of better economic performance so that these companies and households can replenish savings, maybe invest in new infrastructure, position themselves so that in the event that you do have another economic crisis, whether induced by sanctions or another pandemic or another event that you know, we can never be sure of, uh, everyone is in a little bit of a better position. Um, you know, I think we need to remember that we've had basically a decade of economic stagnation. And as Bijan pointed out, you know, that really means the erosion of the sort of uh, infrastructure, the fixed assets in Iran and the savings uh, and economic welfare of households. And I think it's incumbent on the Iranian policymakers to take any opportunity they have to give themselves more resilience uh, by kind of giving a reprieve to these different groups. So it's obviously, economically speaking, pretty clear cut. Politically, it may be another story, but you know, if, if the economic policy matters, then I think re-entering the deal is very much worth it. Um, okay, so I, I kind of feel like, um... <laughs> because I pay so much attention to the hardliners conservatives line of discourse and line of thinking <clears throat> that I'm just going to be posing a lot of what they bring, the questions that they bring to the table in, in this conversation. Um, I also want to welcome for all of our viewers, um, my colleague, Professor Radhi Nast, who's also here, who will be um, joining in on the conversation. But my question is, so the in the lead up to all of these new sanctions that were imposed on Iran, um, and the, the talking points and just sort of the rhetoric from the conservative end of the political spectrum in Iran was that our resistance economy will, will be able to, um, to, to sort of help us sustain uh, against some of this economic pressure. And I remember following the conversations on the resistance economy since it first started to come about in 2012. And people would, you know, but people would laugh and say that this is ridiculous. And, you know, what do they even mean by a resistance economy? This is, there's no way that this is going to work. And in the past few years, of course, inflation has skyrocketed. Of course, people have continued to, to get poorer. But there are elements, as both of you just pointed out in your presentations, in which there is a reality that this idea of the resistance economy and the, the ways in which they've made it a, a reality on the ground. Uh, has allowed the economy not to uh, collapse. And I'm sure there are other reasons for that as well. But from their point of view um, and their intention to continue to turn quote unquote east towards Russia, towards Eurasia, towards China, what, um, how would you respond to that kind of you know, criticism that they might lob lobby, which is that, okay, why should we go into the uncertainty? Or even if we do take these next two years and as as Fandier said, you know the opportunity cost of of it, and and speculating what might happen later in American politics. Let's even say that we do that, but 
uh, what what makes these predictions that you all are making that the resistance economy cannot sustain itself beyond um, beyond this time period similar to predictions that folks were making a few years ago about the resistance economy as a general concept? Uh, as one there, I'll go first. Um, it's 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 important to understand what um, how the resistance economy was initially defined and how it has sort of evolved over time. Because the first the first assumption many uh, had when it started, as you say, 2012, 2013, was that uh, Iran wants to isolate itself, and if it it would have been that scenario, an isolation, import substitution, we will not import anymore, we will not much export anymore, and we will concentrate on domestic demand. It would have been a different story, but it was never that. The very first document uh, about resistance economy actually mentioned uh, an outward economy intentionally, but what it was saying was uh, we have to build capacity domestically, rely less on importation. And if we want to export, we should export uh, value add products. And, and it's, it's very, very fair. I mean, I think from an economic planning point of view has been a very fair. I mean, one thing that, for example, many people miss, if you look at the Iran's, uh, I call them petroleum exports, because we have crude oil exports, we have condensate, this is sort of liquid gas exports. We have petroleum product exports, and we have petrochemical exports. All of them, if you look at all of them, the composition of all of them, it's true that we are uh, exporting less crude oil, but we are exporting as a country more petroleum products, more added value products. So part of the, uh, the process of re resistance economy has been to take our own uh, crude oil, add value to it, you know, either as fuel or as petrochemicals and so on, and then export it. That means that there is a lot more value, economic value in that export than just exporting crude oil. And this is what resistance economy has been about. Now, if you then look at it from that angle and say uh, it is actually an outward oriented economy, which is the case, uh, then you can't, sustain it, or, you, or let's put it this way, you can't optimize it while having sanctions on the country. But the simplest example is, is uh, banking. You export, you want to get your money back, but you can't. Or if you can, you pay something like 10% additional fee on, on the transaction. So it becomes an artificial um, relationship with the rest of the world. And I believe that even hardliners in Iran understand that now. 10 years ago, they didn't understand it because they thought they can operate uh, without limitations. But now they see all of these limitations. You, you even export gas from Iran to Iraq, a, 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 a sort of Iranian ally in the region, and you can't bring your money back. So the concept itself from, again, I, I liked uh, Esfandir's approach to say, okay, let's focus on the economic what, what it means within an economic framework. The concept itself is actually, is, is a workable solution, but you need all of these additional elements, uh, sanctions-free trade, sanctions-free shipping, sanctions-free banking to, to optimize that potential. We are now in that position. The capacity is there, but it's sub-sub-optimal right now, the, the way it's being used. I would just add to that, that I think one thing that we should keep in mind is that the success of the resistance economy uh, as a concept, which flatters uh, Iran's economic policymakers, was very much a bottom up phenomenon. Uh, so, you know, there are some uh, clear areas where the Iranian government from a policy perspective has been able to uh, sort of shore up the economy. I think that is evident in the role of the Ministry of uh, Petroleum and NIOC in the oil trade, the role of the central bank in trying to manage the sort of monetary crisis in the country. But generally speaking, the resistance has come from 
and this is a strong revolutionary sentiment here, but come from the people basically. And you have a labor force in Iran that um, you know, is comprised of people who uh, confront significant economic hardship and they just try and make it work. And one level above them are the sort of class of business owners and uh, whether we're talking about small enterprises or large uh, uh, conglomerates, they are gonna try and make it work given all of the pressures that they're confronting. And in many cases they have, you know, as Bijan highlighted, they targeted exports, they targeted new opportunities, they took advantage of um, sort of some of the structural uh, impacts in, in the labor market and in the economy at large. And they have found a way to survive. And that has flattered Iran's economic policymakers because it looks like the resistance economy was something that was top down and instituted and made Iran resilient. What the reason I highlight this is because I think it's pretty obvious that the constituency that is responsible for the creation of Iran's resistance economy, which is this bottom up constituency, which is households and businesses, are clear that they would like this uh, impediment of sanctions lifted. They have resisted it for a long time. It has been hugely costly to them because they see where they could have been had they not had to contend with uh, all of these sort of rolling crises. And so they want to see, uh, I think, sanctions relief, uh, even if they believe that they could continue out of sheer necessity to put up with all of this difficulty uh, that they have uh, been facing. So, you know, and this is where the political challenge comes for the Raisi administration. It would be very significant politically to deny the reprieve. And that's not to say that Iran has been coerced and that the US has leverage. And I think that's a gross simplification here. Iran can, if necessary, continue to limp along for a very, very long time under sanctions. That's what the last 10 years have shown us. This is a large economy that's dynamic and can sort of uh, continue to get by. But making, but for Iranian political decision making to lead to a situation where that has to be the circumstance for the general public and for the business community is a very politically fraught decision for the establishment to make. And I think that's ultimately what they're gonna to have to contend with. You know, um, does making certain concessions around the nuclear program, does allowing the US to restore the deal, it, how do we approach that trade-off, which is politically challenging, against this domestic political landscape where you have people who are really tired and exhausted and want not to have to, to deal with this kind of uh, period of, of crisis uh, for another uh, 10 years possibly. So I think that's how that trade-off is there. And, and hopefully, you know, the hardliners will become more appreciative of that as they contend with having to govern a country um, now that Raisi is president, and uh, and maybe we will see kind of the more pragmatic aspects of economic policy uh, come to the forefront a little bit more. Can I add something, Nargis? Uh, I think it's we have a phenomenon in parallel. So it's one thing, the upside of uh, getting to a point when where sanctions are lifted. That's one scenario to look at in parallel to also uh, project what could happen if Iran continues to limp the way uh, Esfandiar was, was describing. I, you're right, it's like, it's, it's like a house that has become older and older and you haven't had the money to invest and you, you cope with it. But the fact is that the, the more the economic substance and the infrastructure substance of Iran erodes, the more there will be potential for social unrest. We are already hearing uh, officials saying that this coming winter, there may be a shortage in gas supplies for the, for the households. Remember the social unrest when fuel prices were changed and then when water shortages emerged? These are all gas shortages, electricity shortages, water mismanagement, a lot of them are a consequence of lack of investment. And lack of investment is a consequence of the government not having enough funds. That's the other way to look at it. 
the upside of one scenario and the severe downside of the other scenario. Um, Barry, did you wanna jump in? Sure, uh, just a question. Thank, first of all, thank you very much, Esfandiar and Bijan for that fascinating uh, analysis. So, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, we saw Nagas asked a lot of questions about the political, Im the, the implications were political decisions that Iran is making. And we sort of have a better sense of where political decisions, uh, strategic decisions, military decisions in Iran are made. Can you both give us a flavor? Where are these economic issues debated? And, and, uh, and where is the sort of center of gravity about these? And then how, how are they? What are the forums or ways in which then they are married to political decisions in Iran and, and foreign policy decisions? Shall I go, Sandia? Yeah. Um, so I think that the core um, decision making body that <clears throat> also discusses some of these issues is the Supreme National Security Council, where you have obviously um, it's more geared towards uh, strategic and security and foreign policy decisions, but a lot of these discussions, uh, especially the discussion about um, uh, the need for, for um, uh, you know, introducing policies that address poverty and address the situation of the lower income classes and so on are also debated in there. We have had in the past three years, I think, we have had something called the Economic Coordination Committee, which is basically the heads of the three branches of power, um, uh, which sort of is, is, a, is a committee to make fast decisions. You know, for example, they say that the decision to, um, to increase the fuel prices in 2019 was, was uh, decided there and some of the other decisions. So it's important to understand it's not President Raisi alone who will come and make a decision. It will go beyond him and, and there will be different, um, different uh, committees and councils. Obviously the parliament comes in in many of the questions, especially uh, discussing the budget. And, and we have, as I mentioned earlier, the budget deficit and how they handle uh, the budget question is, is one of the structural deficiencies in, in Iran right now. So that there the parliament comes in, in the, in the debates. And, and uh, we have had even between the, uh, both parliament and government being uh, controlled by the, by the hardliners, there have been uh, disagreements or, or divergences in, in, in their debates on, for example, what to do right now, one of the debates is what to do with the, with the subsidized exchange rate. We have a subsidized exchange rate that is less than a quarter of the free market or the importers for exporters exchange rate. And that is one of the biggest platforms for corruption right now in Europe. If you have access to that low exchange rate and then you can sell your currency at the free market rate, you can become rich overnight very quickly, and many do. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a it's a it's a platform for corruption. But getting rid of it or adjusting it somehow will lead to, in some cases, imaginary inflation. But it will lead to inflation, and it it will have a political cost for the government. So disagreements are there, but most of these critical decisions are 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 decided in a number of councils. Uh, Esfandiar, please. Uh, Add whatever just, just briefly, I would add to that, that going back to kind of this idea of the bottom up uh, economic policy making that I mentioned earlier, one of the things that I have seen in, in the last few years, which I do think is very positive uh, for the long term, is that the private sector has become much more sophisticated about how it produces its own research about what's happening in the economy. Part I showed you from the Iran Chamber of Commerce. Uh, PMI data, they, they started collecting that data for the first time in 2018. It's a private sector undertaking, and they're using this more sophisticated analysis and data and uh, publishing of reports in order to advocate for better economic policy. And um, at least with the Rouhani administration, the private sector working through bodies such as the Iran Chamber of Commerce and associations for different types of manufacturers, 
um, they were able to, you know, in a serious way, I think, um, get the ear of government and, and basically say, we think X, Y, Z policies are disadvantageous. It remains to be seen whether the Raisi administration um, seeks out those opinions quite the same way, uh, but uh, whether or not they do, they will hear a lot from the private sector about where uh, they think that there are issues around, let's say, corruption or around uh, inefficient policies. Um, and the final thing I would add is that, you know, because of this really difficult experience over the last decade, the Iranian public has had to learn a lot more about the economy. Um, and to the extent that we see things like mobilizations where you have strikes or protests um, that are motivated by economic grievances, a lot of that is based on a kind of community level education that's taking place around where are the pain points in the economy, where is government policy failing uh, to uh, kind of make life better. And so that's also, I think, quite positive, you know, in countries that are historically oil dominated economies you as a member of the public you didn't really need to know a lot about the economy because you were pretty much guaranteed that the economy was going to do okay most years and when it wasn't the government had the financial resources to kind of make up for the shortfall iran has been in a very different position the last 10 years and so there's this greater literacy about what makes the economy turn and and in the long run i think that's quite positive if the government uh, becomes responsive uh, to um, that sort of claims making by the public. So there are um, a, a lot of questions in the in the uh, Q and A, which I want to start posing. Um, one of them that follows up on what you were just saying, Esfandiar. I'll pose a couple if it's okay with you guys, because we actually have a lot of questions and not a ton of time left, but. Um, the follow-up um, to your uh, remarks, uh, Esfandiar, which actually this question came a little bit earlier, is have there been any Iranian business organizations that either have weighed in or could exert influence on the political debate within the hardliners? And then there's another question about uh, the 25-year the strategic partnership agreement that the Rouhani administration signed with China, uh, promising a $400 billion Chinese investment. And the question is, how would IEC administration approach this deal? I kind of want to tack in a question that I had onto this, and I would love to hear what you all think or, or what you, how you're thinking of this, which is that IEC government um, you know, touted as a huge victory the inclusion of Iran into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization a few weeks ago. And since then, and obviously this is something that's going to take a few years to even materialize, but since then, what I found really interesting is that there's been a lot of conversation, especially within certain conservative and, and hardline uh, factions about then the need to uh, for Iran to enter into the FATF. Um, and this is something that they were so against during the, the Rouhani administration. And there's already debate beginning to formulate within them about the possibility of this. But it strikes me as something interesting, which I know both of you have written about, Vadi has written about in the past over the summer after Rohan, after Raisi's election, but which is that a lot of these obstacles that were being put into place in front of Rouhani might now be easier for them to resolve on their own um, now that they've sort of con uh, consolidated power. And so I wanted to bring in that question of the SCO with the China deal with the FATF and like how these things are being considered all together. So I'll turn it over to both of you for those questions and then we'll go back again to Q&A. So just on the first question about uh, the, the business groups, I mean, I think that I had seen that question when I sort of uh, pointed out the role of the Iran Chamber of Commerce. And I, I think it's an open question about whether or not they will be listened to by the new administration. So we have to kind of wait and see uh, whether they will have the same kind of influence. But my sense is that as this administration and the technocrats in the administration start to grapple with these questions, you know, continuity of knowledge is important and continuity of knowledge around how do you survive sanctions, a lot of that sits with the private sector. And so I think there will be an effort to hear out um, opinions and views on, on what government policy should look like. On, I'll take the SCO and the China deal question sort of together. The first thing I'd say is that, and I have to say this every time, the $400 billion figure for that 25 year agreement is um, 
is not a real number. That's it's a completely invented figure. Uh, there is no actual financial target associated with the framework agreement for the comprehensive strategic partnership that China and Iran have signed. Um, and the main thing to highlight there is that China has really not made any significant uh, investments in Iran in the last decade because they have not been able to due to um, the sort of uh, challenges posed by U.S. secondary sanctions and the challenges posed around um, basically the limited banking channels related to things like uh, Iran's uh, lack of implementation of the FATF action plan. So to go to your uh, question, I guess, I think there is a, a realization here that the Raisi administration is going to go after these political wins related to a turn to the East. And they're going to do that, I think in large part, not because they see uh, East and West is mutually exclusive, but if they want to differentiate their foreign policy and their economic diplomacy from that of the Rouhani administration, one really smart way to do that is to restore the JCPOA, but also to be able to say, we finally managed to enter the SCO, we finally managed to start implementing the China-Iran deal, whereas our predecessors were not able to do that. But to operationalize any of these uh, political wins, whether it's uh, joining the SCO, um, whether it is the further integration with the Eurasian Economic Union, which is the uh, Russian-led free trade bloc, uh, whether it's an increase in regional trade uh, on the back of some of the diplomacy that's taking place through the, the Baghdad format or bilaterally um, with the UAE um, and Iraq. Um, at the end of the day, it really does come down to whether or not Iran starts to remove these hurdles uh, related to sanctions and related to its financial blacklisting. So I think, you know, it is good. It's a good sign that those debates have started again. It shows a degree of realism on the part of this administration and, and policymakers close to the administration about how do they actualize some of these political victories so that they're not just on paper, but they're felt in practice, particularly with regards to kind of the um, actual economic well-being of uh, businesses and households in the country. I, I'll add a few things. I agree with everything Sandir said. Uh, first of all, uh, there, is a, there is an attempt to inject positive news uh, as a way of uh, affecting or positively affecting the psychology of economic players in Europe. Mohsen Rezai, who is now the economic deputy of the president, when he ran for president, he was saying that he would put together a committee to produce positive news on a daily basis. And, and it's true, psychology matters. I mean, when you go back to the, uh, to the chart that Esfandiar showed at the beginning about the exchange rates, when the, the second massive devaluation was also partly psychological, it was, the question of whether Trump will attack Iran just before his, you know, the, the elections in, uh, in the U.S. So psychology matters, and they try to do that. The other factor that we have to take into account, um, a lot of the businesses have, that have emerged from the hardline circles in Iran, whether they are RGC businesses or the different revolutionary and religious foundations, uh, what has happened in the last 10 years is that they have started exporting too. It's important to understand. They have become exporters. And once you become an exporter, you start to grapple in a different way with the challenges of banking sanctions and FATF and so on. They realize that we need sanctions relief. 10 years ago, they I really, I can tell you, 10 years ago, they were not focused on these issues. Now that they realize, they or push their own representatives into the Raisi. I mean, uh, and, and it's in, important to understand, it's not a just a question of um, different institutions representing them. They themselves are trying to influence policy, and that's an important shift in Iran, in my view. Great, thank you. Um, so um, another question is beyond sanctions relief, this is from the audience, um, what do you see as lower hanging pragmatic policy choices? Um, and a question that we had at the beginning of a, the event is, um, I think you, you, you all have touched upon this, but I think it does 
um, that warrants uh, a little bit more if we just had a few minutes left in the conversation anyways. But how important is it for Iran to obtain access to foreign assets um, particularly for propping up the Riyadh, but also in connect, and I think this is in connection to Amir Abdullahian, the for, uh, foreign minister's comments uh, on Iranian television a few nights ago about the $10 billion. Um, so sort of bringing that in, because we haven't talked about that and the, the question that I posed earlier, and I think that we'll have to close out. Um, this will be our last question, our last two questions. For those of you okay, that- I'll go. <laughs> uh, uh, Low-hanging fruit, uh, as Van Dier mentioned, the, the significance of the private sector. Uh, if I were in charge, I would urge the government to give more space to the private sector. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of barriers to, to the free uh, uh, activity, to the sort of optimization of the potential of private sector in Iran. There are too many, too many um, areas of mismanagement, of, of um, corruption, of uh, uh, the government using its power, its licensing arm to put pressure on, on the private sector. They, they should um, genuinely improve uh, the business climate, the investment climate for, um, uh, for, for the Iranian private sector. There is a lot of potential. There is a lot of unused potential. Uh, the other potential to, to achieve some economic uh, growth or economic impetus is to address inefficiencies. The Iranian economy has a lot of inefficiencies uh, from energy inefficiency to construction inefficiency. And I would also say, uh, I call it government, uh, governance uh, inefficiency. You know, they could actually improve uh, for example, by using uh, e-government and, and in Iran, mobile government, mobile-based uh, interaction. So there are there are areas where uh, sound policy and sound economic policy uh, can can address some of the some of the bottlenecks and issues. I would also urge the government not to fall into the trap of uh, uh, of sort of these distributive policies of, for example investing billions into social housing that may turn similar to what happened on the Ahmadinejad that you had this so-called mehr housing scheme that ended up in hundreds of unfinished projects in Iran and wasted a lot of the resources. So for example, if President Raisi really wants to uh, build a million new homes uh, a year, pass it on to the private sector, pass it on to the small construction cooperatives and housing cooperatives that actually have existed in Iran for years. So there are things that they should do and there are things that they shouldn't do to, to improve the overall economic conditions uh, without sanctions being lifted. Uh, the, there is no doubt that access to Iranian assets, and as, as I mentioned, it's not just Iranian assets that belong to the central bank and to the government. There are also Iranian assets that belong to the rest of the economic players. Access to them will, will improve um, the situation. And in parallel, uh, the lifting of sanctions will allow um, the, the economic players to, to reduce some of the uh, imposed costs they have right now. I mentioned one of them, 10% fee on uh, an international transaction is, is the, has become the norm. And if, if that, that sort of barrier, those types of impediments are removed, it will have a positive impact on trade activity and it will have a positive impact on the value of the real. But without those, the pressure will stay on, on the value of the national currency and also on, on inflation. I'll stop here. Just very briefly, I think um, one, I'll add to that, we're, going to be publishing some work on this in the coming month. But uh, one of the things that's sort of uh, also in the national debate is uh, employment laws and regulations. And a lot of the kind of public consternation about the economic situation is also related to the fact that a lot of people, even if they remain employed, uh, have been pushed into situations where they're on contracts and it's like fixed term labor arrangements and it leaves people in a very precarious position. 
And so I think part of what is going to be important for uh, any Iranian government to look at is to sort of rethink the social safety net a little bit so that it's not simply uh, targeted welfare transfers when people are in poverty, but also giving people the economic kind of confidence and stability that they need to like basically avoid falling into that uh, situation of poverty in the first place. And there are a lot of people really living on the edge in Iran, and it has to do with um, basically precarious work. So that, you know, that's very like inside baseball when it comes to whether or not Washington should, what Washington cares about when it comes to Iran's economy. But, um, you know, these are an important part of the picture. And at the end of the day, um, I think one of the lessons of the last decade again is that to really evaluate something like the impact of sanctions you cannot just look at foreign exchange and trade and oil exports you know it's it's all part of an integrated system an economic system and so you know we really do need to look at basically these other dimensions including things like the impact on the occupational class structure in Iran um, related to sanctions. And there's a really interesting work being done in these areas. And so, you know, I think uh, that's something that uh, is another sort of outcome uh, of everything that uh, we've gone through and, and seen take place. Thank you for that. I mean, I wish we could actually continue this conversation for longer because now it's fine. You're, you're, you're starting to, to hit on topics that I love talking about, which is these questions of economic precarity and, and like how, how this is reminiscent across so many different societies. And it's not just the Iran problem and, and what the neoliberalization of all of these economies mean. Uh, but that just means we have to have you guys on another time. So uh, I want to thank everyone in the audience for joining us and for all of your excellent questions. I really want to thank Bijan and Esandir for their excellent remarks and, and putting up with all of our questions um, and encourage everyone to, to continue to follow their work. Um, and we will uh, have more events and uh, projects and research coming out throughout the semester and next. So please do stay in touch.